I wanted to share with you in the next 20 minutes three uh, big ideas from neuroscience that I feel would really shape the world of business in the coming 10 years. And that if you embrace them early, I think would help each and every one of you find uses for neuroscience in your particular industry. So before that, I'll say one thing about uh, the field. So I'm a neuroscientist. I spent, uh, as you just heard, over 10 years studying the brain. And then in the last five years, I've been working at a business school, Kellogg, in Chicago. And that's unusual. There's only a handful of neuroscientists who actually made this transition from studying the brain to working in a business school and teaching MBA students and helping businesses uh, understand the brain. And the idea behind that uh, is that there's more and more companies that find that looking at the brain and understanding how we think is helpful in many ways in both how they understand their customers, how they build teams, how they hire, how they evaluate content and create more creative ideas, and essentially how they understand themselves. And the way it went was that first the companies were interested in that. So big companies in the world like Facebook and Google and Amazon started to ask the business schools what do you know about us using neuroscience as a tool? And the business schools were somewhat at a loss. They didn't have neuroscience uh, in-house. And that's when they reached out to people like me and said, come work and be part of our faculty so we can actually answer those questions. So this is an example of a technology looking for science. People wanted it. And then the merger between neuroscience and business happened as a consequence. So indeed, the world of neuroscience in business is primarily dominated by two industries in the US. One is the tech industry, Silicon Valley, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Twitter, and all those companies that already were always looking into new technologies and new ways to understand people better. And now they find that there's an amazing tool that they can harness and use it to really get into the customer's mind. So they were driving it. And in fact, if you look at my history, most of my grad students, when they finish the PhD working with me, they get an offer from one of those companies uh, to go and do the same thing they did for their research now on behalf of those companies. Many of them take it, some don't. But the fact that neuroscience becomes a thing that companies recruit more than they recruit regular marketing students, more than they recruit regular analytics students, suggests that they gamble on neuroscience becoming a big field in the coming 10 years. The other industry that really dominates this research is the uh, uh, entertainment industry, Hollywood. The gaming industry, computer games, uh, movies, they really want to use neuroscience in order to understand how to make better content and how to evaluate content in different ways. And I'll give you an intuition uh, or two examples of why this is important before I jump into the three ideas that I want to share with you. The intuition is that in many ways, when we ask people questions, sometimes as marketing managers, for instance, or marketing researchers, we somehow get answers that aren't complete. Many of you know that you ask customers what they want, you gave them what they wanted, and somehow the sales didn't rise because they didn't know what they want or what they told you is not what they actually ended up doing. We all uh, buy jeans for a skinny version of ourselves. So when marketing asks us, hey, do you want these shoes or these shoes? We say, oh, the, the nicer, expensive one. I'm going to be very rich next year. I'm going to buy them then. Doesn't happen. We sign up for the gym a year in advance, thinking that we're going to go every day, but then somehow we don't. So if someone asks us, will you go to the gym every day? We say yes. but. We don't really uh, have the access to the part of the brain that says, no way you're going to do that every day. And we all have examples like that. The other insight into that is that many times people actually give you answers, and those answers are correct. It's just that if you look at the answer, you don't really know what went into the mind of the person. I'll give you a concrete example. Imagine you run a survey, and you ask a person how much they liked a product. And you give them a scale from 1 to 10. And let's say one person says, oh, 8. Circles an 8 and done. And then the next person says, I'm not really sure. Maybe it was a 6, maybe it was a 10. How to say? I guess I'm going to circle an 8. From the perspective of marketing research, those 8s 
look the same. You don't know if one person just felt an eight or one person said it's maybe a six, maybe a 10, I don't know. They look the same to you, but if you had access to their brain, you could see the confusion, you could see the thought process that turned into their mind and you could look at those numbers differently, maybe weigh them differently. The idea behind what I'm saying is that many times asking questions or observing behaviors gives you fraction of the reality, but not the whole story. But if you look at their brain, you can actually see what people want, what triggers them, what will change their mind, what's their price point, how to negotiate with them, how uh, they answer questions under stress. And you can also understand yourself as a person and say, what are my optimal decision-making states? What will make me uh, be more accurate rely on data more other than have intuitions that are not based on evidence and so on. So that is where neuroscience comes. It gives answers to all of those things that I mentioned and it dominates right now marketing because people can understand customers, management and strategy because people can actually study their own brain and decide how to make decisions better. So should you make decisions better in the morning or in the evening when you're alone with your friends, uh, just before the deadline, hours earlier, after consulting, without any advice, all of those things, we can now understand our brain better and help ourselves make best choices. We can actually build teams that are more uh, aligned in thinking. So we can understand what you think when I say something. So how can we use the same language to really share an idea such that it resonates between multiple brains? We can actually uh, interview people better because we can understand how they answer questions and understand what's true and what's not true. And we can do a variety of things to content that allow us to be more creative, understand how creativity works, and also evaluate that. We can look at the brain of people while they watch a commercial and actually see what got into their memory, what made them happy, what didn't land, what made them get kind of very, very disinterested, and so on. So we can understand a lot of things about customers. Now, all of that is the reality right now. If any of you is interested in that, you can probably find someone nearby who's a neuroscientist who can help you implement what I just said in your business. And that is already the current reality. What I wanna talk about in the next 10 minutes is about the future. And I'll share with you quickly three ideas that I think are out there and will really change the way we do marketing, business and negotiations and uh, decision making in the coming decade if they become what I think they should be a reality. The first idea uh, comes from a research that was uh, done in 2012, and it actually showed us that memory doesn't work the way we thought it did. The model people had of memory was that you listen to me right now, you hear information, you take it and you put it in your brain and it becomes part of your memory. And as long as you keep it there and don't forget it, it's always a memory that you can load and use. About eight years ago, research in neuroscience taught us that actually memory doesn't work this way. Memory works more like a, a file that you keep overwriting with new information without ever getting to the root, to the source. Meaning, if right now you take what I'm saying and you put it in your memory, and tomorrow someone asks you to tell them, what did you learn today? You load the file that you put here today, and you tell them something. But while you talk to them, the memory is exposed to new information, to changes, it gets reshaped. And when you're done talking about it, you actually resave the memory and you overwrite the original. So if your mood is a bit different tomorrow, or if someone that you talk to gives you new information, you will actually internalize that and overwrite the original with new information. And every time you use a memory, you open it, change it, and save it. So over time, memories change. This is a feature of the brain, not a bug. It's something that nature gave us so that we can actually adapt and change things over time. So we won't be stuck with the same, say, bad experience forever, but be able to rethink about bad experiences, shape them differently, and overwrite on top of them such that we can actually not have trauma, but have some good ways of looking at bad experiences. Now, why is it interesting? Because studies that my colleagues and I did allow us to actually show you how easy it is to change a memory of a person, overwrite the original, and make them believe that a memory that isn't theirs is theirs. Here's how it's done in the lab. In the lab, we beam people to the lab as a subject. Imagine you're a subject. And we show you two cards with two pictures of, say, two girls. And we say, you don't know any of those girls. They look very similar. Who do you find more attractive? The one on the left or the one on the right? And you might say, I like the one uh, on the left. And then we give you the card that you chose. And we ask you to hold it in your hand and explain to us in one sentence why you picked that woman. 
So you might say, I look at the card and I think that she has a nice smile. You say, fantastic. We pick two new cards, two different people. And we ask you again, between those two, let's say men this time, who do you find more attractive? And you say this time, the one on the right, give you the card that you ask, you hold it in your hand and you say, I like this guy because he has nice earrings. And we do it again and again and again for one hour. In your mind, this is all that happens. You make decisions between two options and you explain them. But the reality is that we don't just give you always the card that you chose. Every now and then, we use sleight of hands to give you the card you didn't select. So if you chose the card on the right, we kind of use a trick and we give you the card on the left. And the two interesting things that we see is one, people rarely notice that they received the card they didn't choose. They chose A and they got B and they don't say, sorry, you gave me the card I didn't choose. But more interestingly, they then go on and explain to us why the choice that they received was their choice. So they chose A, I give them B, they take B and they say, I chose B because of so-and-so. Which means that in the course of very short time, a few seconds, if I can make your brain not notice that I'm putting a new information there, you will not only take it, but also come up with answers. And what we see in the studies is that the more I ask you about the memory, the more I ask you to explain it, the more you convince yourself that this was your choice to the point that if you come back tomorrow and you see the same options, you will now choose the one that you didn't want the day before because you created in your mind a memory that this was the choice. Now, here is an example of how it can be used in the context of business. Imagine that uh, you're going to the supermarket and you have a list of things you want to buy, milk and bread and uh, pasta, and you start shopping in the aisles and you get to the milk section and you see a lot of milk options and you debate between the 2% or the 1%, and then you maybe choose the 1% and you put it in a basket and you keep shopping for other things. And at some point, between the moment you chose the milk and the moment you get to the checkout to buy things, I sneak into your basket and I replace the 1% with 2%. There's a chance that if you bought enough things and if you don't really care about 2% or 1%, if it's just the same for you, you will not notice that I replace the choice. You will buy the other one, and if I'm a marketing company and I stop you in the way outside and I say, you know, we're from Potter & Gamble. And you want to know why you bought this milk and not that milk. Can you give us an answer? You will come up with an answer of why you wanted the one that you didn't want. You will tell us. And the more you tell us, you convince yourself. Such that if you come back tomorrow, you will always buy the other one because you created in your mind a memory that says this is my choice right now. And the idea here is that as creepy as it sounds, we can actually change your memories and write all kinds of things there if we manage to penetrate your brain and change our ideas. Now, the examples I give you right now are very, very benign. They're very easy. I just uh, sneak a change and you don't notice and that's all. But we have all kinds of tools that I'm happy to elaborate on if you ask me later that allow us to really change important memories, not just the milk 1%, 2%, but really important things to the point that we can actually change things that you think are like your core of who you are. And this means that the reality of what we think of as our identity becomes unstable because anyone can change memories. And marketing managers are starting to ask us questions like, can I use that to make a person want something that I deliver into their brain? Or can I just give them things and help them see why this thing is good for them? And as you can see already, this is pretty alarming and pretty powerful. So you can see the two ends of this thing. If you're a marketing manager, this looks to you like a magical way to basically get everyone to want what you offer them without the need to even overwork the convincing part. If you're a customer, you might say, I don't want people to put thoughts in my brain that didn't come from me. I want to maintain my skepticism and decision making. And the world we're heading into in terms of neuroscience shows us that the possibilities become very, very close to controlling our thoughts. And I think it's important that we decide right now as customers and managers, whether we want it. Idea number two. Idea number two that I like uh, a lot is an idea that uh, is so new that it doesn't have a name in neuroscience, but the name I'm going to use for the sake of our couple of minutes ahead is going to be sensory addition or the ability to add senses. What we learned in the last couple of years, primarily in the last uh, five years, but there's also one work from even 30 years ago that showed evidence that it's going to work, is that we can actually potentially add senses to humans. What I mean by that is that humans are born with five senses that nature gave us. We have the sense of smell, the sense of sight, the sense of audition, a taste. We can experience the world using those senses. In fact, our brain doesn't really see, hear, or smell the world. Our brain sits in our head in a dark place, colder and full of water, and all the brain knows about the world 
comes from the sensors. So the eyes, they sample uh, electromagnetic radiation in the world using the uh, retina. They turn the photons in the world into the language of the brain. And then the brain is blasted with the information that comes from the eyes, and it calls this seeing. Same with the ears. The ears take molecular compression, turn them into the language of the brain. They send it to the auditory cortex. And there, the brain makes sound or calls this thing hearing. So all the brain knows is one language, language of the brain. And those plug and play devices that we call the sensors are made to change the language of the brain into the language of the world. Now, nature is full of other devices that do things differently. For example, bats don't have eyes. They have something called echolocation. So when they fly, they can actually uh, send mini sonar signals. And it bounces back from walls or from obstacles. And their brain knows how to turn this electromagnetic frequency into seeing. So that's how the bat knows what's out there. Bats can actually see things that you cannot see because they sample different parts of the world. You might not see that right now there's a ray of a cell reception coming out of my pocket into a cell tower because I have a cell phone in my pocket. But a bat would see it and it would fly between those rays of lights because it's part of the bat's reality. Now, the bat's brain speaks the same language as our brain. It's smaller, it looks differently, but it speaks the same language. It's only that the eyes of the bat are different than the eyes of a human, so it has different experience of the world. Similarly, birds have magnets in their head, and those magnets tell the bird where is north, so uh, birds can easily fly and always align themselves with magnetic fields of Earth. And they just know where north is automatically. It's a sense that they have. Humans don't. They have to use compasses, or they have to use the sun. We have to infer the north, but birds just feel it. The same way we just smell things. And nature is full of many, many other devices that speak to brains. And what we're learning in the last couple of years is that there's a way to actually take the eyes of the bat, plug them into the brain, say, of a human, and wait for the brain to learn how to experience what the eyes are blasting and see different things. So humans could, in theory, in theory this was never done, learn how to see more with the eyes that we give their brain coming from the bat, or learn to sense magnetic fields of Earth if we take the magnetic sensors of the bird and plug them into the human brains. This was not done. What was done are experiments with people who actually lost senses, like people who became deaf or became blind, where a scientist have now been able to put retinal implant or cochlear implant that are devices that replace the ear or the eye and feed information into the brain and restore their sight or their sound. So we know how to restore things that were lost. We never actually built new senses. But the reason I'm telling you that is because there's one important thing in the world of business that is benefiting from that, which is the remarkable thing here is that if you take a new device and you plug it into the brain, you don't have to teach the brain anything. You just gave the brain new information that it never saw before, and the brain somehow learns to find meaning in it. It's because the brain is an amazing sponge of information. What the brain is fantastic at is taking signals that come into it in the world and finding meaning in them. If there is any pattern in a signal, the brain's going to find it. No one teaches you when you're a baby how to see. No one tells you you have to take the photons and put this one here and this one here. And if the frequencies go like this, it's actually moving. No one teaches you that. You just get your brain bombarded with information. And over the first months of your life, you learn to see. Your brain just learns how to find meaning in a signal that comes to it. Same with hearing, same with movement. You try a lot of things without any supervision when you're a baby. And at some point, your brain learns to find meaning in it. And if that's true, what it means is that any signal that has meaning in it if we can actually put it inside the brain, the brain is going to find meaning in it. And that is where I think businesses could benefit from that. Because the world of big data, the world of machine learning and AI, right now is trying to replicate what the brain does. If you ever heard about machine learning or AI, what they do is they try to take what the brain is doing naturally and implement it in machines. But the brain is far superior to any machine in doing that, in taking signal and finding meaning in it. It doesn't require any. A, depths of layers or uh, deciding on how many neurons or what uh, uh, decision function you will use. It just does it automatically. So what we're asking the question is, can we give data into the brain in a format that the brain will know and will help us solve problems? And here's how we do that in a concrete way. In a study that was done by a colleague of mine, he brings subjects and he puts a vest on their body. The vest has thousands or hundreds of sensors or motors that actually press on your body. And he turns the motor on. And when he turns it on, people feel pressure. Maybe they feel pressure on their left shoulder and then a little bit uh, uh, pressure on their back. And he turns it on for a few seconds. And then he says, for this feeling that you just had, 
what do you think you should do? Go left or go right? The person says, I have no idea. So he says, okay, just guess. If you don't know, just make a guess. The guy says, okay, I'm guessing left. And then he tells him, correct, this was the right answer. You just got $1 for your participation. Let's try again. He turns the vest on. This time the person feels some pressure in the uh, neck and somewhere in the lower back. And again, the question appears, do you want to go left or right? The person says, this time I want to go right. And he gets feedback that says correct or incorrect. This is happening for one hour. For one hour, the person basically feels things in their body, makes a choice, and gets feedback that says yes or no. And what we see is that over time, people learn. As in, they start finding meaning. Their brains find context signal in the complex uh, data that is bombarded. They start saying, every time I feel something in my uh, right shoulder, I should go left, and in my, in my belly, I should go right. And they start finding meaning. And what we see effectively is that in the beginning, they just kind of make guesses. They just guess, and they have no correct or incorrect superiority. They just kind of make equal amount of yes, no. And at some point, they start making a lot more correct answers. They start getting better. Now, here's the cool part. Unbeknownst to them, the thing that they feel in their body, the pattern, aren't just random patterns. It's actually the S&P 500 the stock exchange in the US that's actually turned from a Bloomberg screen of information into a feeling in their body. And the choices they make, left, right, are actually buy and sell. They don't know it. They just feel something and they choose left, right, and they get feedback. But what we do here is we take a data, turn it into a feeling, let the brain find meaning in it and make decisions without knowing what the meaning is, and consistently get better and better in trading stocks without knowing that you're trading stocks. So here, we basically took a brain and made it do the thing it's best at. Find meaning in complex data that many people that look at data itself, if you give someone a Bloomberg screen with full of numbers, they're not really able to see all the complexities there. There's just too much information there and their brain is not able to identify it. But if you turn it into a sense, people can actually use the part of the brain that is intuitive, that is not thinking, but actually feeling and find meaning. So the second business idea that I want to share with you is that I think that we're moving towards a world where we're going to harness back the thing that we gave computers. We gave computers the idea of machine learning and AI and let them do things for us because they can do it faster, without sleep, high process, high speed. But there's something that we are better at, our brains are. And if we learn to turn data into a feeling, we can actually potentially give back human brains the ability to solve problems that machines cannot solve, or we can integrate the two. The third idea, and the last one I'm going to share with you, is an idea that uh, I think is going to change in many ways the world of entertainment, but it also will change the world of uh, marketing. And that is a, a knowledge that came again from five years ago that we can actually access your dreams, read the content of their dreams, and write into them. Up until not long ago, dreams were something that humans were fascinated by but had no access to. If you go back to the days of Freud and Carl Jung and all the big names in uh, dream research, they were talking about dreams, but they didn't really know what the dream was. All they could do is ask you when you wake up to tell them what you dreamt. And we know that the content of the dream that you speak about when you wake up is not aligned perfectly with what you actually dreamt. People make up stuff to complete the missing gaps, or they use the language of their awake self to talk about their dreams. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the 1930s, People who were asked to describe their dreams, describe them in black and white. People, everyone thought the dreams are black and white. As soon as Hollywood started making movies in color, people started describing their dreams in color because what they thought is a dream is like a movie. If you ask me how my dreams work, I'm losing the language of movies and I talk about them in black and white. And as soon as they become color, I start thinking about dreams in color. So clearly people didn't really know how their dreams look. They just kind of used the language of their awake self to describe them. Fast forward to the last couple of years, we can now use a technique in neuroscience that I'm involved with in developing to actually access the brains of people while they're sleeping and get the visual or the semantic story of their dream outside. And this is remarkable because this is a first step in interacting with your brain behind your back. We don't need you. You don't need to ask the customer any question. We just get straight into your mind and we access information there that you don't even know yourself, that you, if I asked you, would be wrong about. And we can actually start accessing the thing that uh, drive your thought process. So in the very least, we can see what your dreams are. But at the more extreme version of that, which is what we're doing right now, we can actually use all kinds of cues from the outside world, like smells, for instance, to actually navigate your dreams a little bit while you're sleeping and make you dream about specific things. 
So where I think it's heading, and we haven't gotten there, but we're going toward that, is into a world where we can actually change your behavior by getting to your brain when you're sleeping, when your guards are down, and helping you change things in your mind. So we can actually convince you of some things, or we can actually help you remove some thoughts that are not helpful for you. If you have trauma, we can actually reduce the trauma. We can help you strengthen your memories. So you learn something when you're awake and you go to sleep and we actually make your brain keep rehearsing that when you're sleeping so you know it better. And we can even help you make decisions differently by playing all kinds of movies that feel to you like reality. Like you actually feel like you are a living option one versus stop and two. And now you know more about how it would feel like. So when you wake up, you actually have better sense of what you want to do. I was very vague on that because it's a world of information. But what I'm trying to say, and with that I'm going to finish almost, is that it's a new canvas for creativity that we are unlocking. You used to just think about your awake life as you, and then when you go to sleep, things just get processed without you actually having control. Now that neuroscientists are giving us access to our dreams and to our sleep, we can actually make you sleep better. We can actually help you understand why you don't fall asleep or how to wake up or how to use sleep in the most efficient way, how to uh, share it, and mostly how to actually use the narratives that our brain creates to either help us change things or at least enjoy them more by creating content, movies by Spielberg that you see when you go to sleep. So I think of it as a new canvas for opportunity that we don't really know how it's going to go, but we know that if VR is doing well, then dreams should do much better. Because VR is a lame version of a dream. You put the goggles, you see a dinosaur. If you get scared, you do this, and it's over. When you're dreaming, it feels like reality, and it fools all of your senses. So in many ways, we can get, get you to live in multiple worlds at the same time. One when you're awake, one when you're asleep, and experience a lot more. And this richness is what I think is important. Here is my last point. That I'm done. Um, the world we live in is changing. We get access to our brain that really shapes how we think about ourselves. In many ways, this could be very, very alarming because this means the reality that we think is the one we live in might be flawed. We might get to experience more of the world if we use different eyes or memories would not be reliable or maybe a part of our brain that were meant to be locked will become suddenly reality. We don't know how it's going to play out. But what we know is that it requires a change of paradigm to really accept it. And the best example I can use that will help you and helps me think about the shift we're looking at is a shift that I'm using and that I want to finish uh, often when I think about uh, 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei. When he pointed his telescope to the moons of Jupiter and he observed their orbits, something didn't work. And the only way for him to explain the movement of the planets was to put the sun in the center and put Earth as just one more planet. And it felt to him like a big shift that he had a hard time accepting. But when he did, the world has changed. In the same way, I feel that we're understanding right now that in our own brain, there are many, many planets there. And what we call me, what we think is our heart, might not be the most important one. It might be just one of many. And it's not the one that processes all information. And if we accept that in our own head, there might be other parts, unconscious ones, that drive the wagon, that are the dominant parts, that are the ones that we can actually explore better, understand ourselves better, we will not only see much more of the world out there the way Galileo Galilei did and explore the universe, we'll also understand the most interesting thing in the universe, which is us. Thank you.